So it's all about sitting here and thinking, this could really use a fill in the blank and finding something and then just pulling a mic, which is usually just sitting here, just pulling it forward, checking the level real quick, adjusting it, recording it, done. When I was in my, my first sort of purpose-built studio in, in downtown Raleigh, and this is back in 2010, 2012, when I did Tomb Raider, I think was the first score that came out of that studio. And I had a single microphone preamp that had two channels in it, but I owned one microphone. And I didn't really use it for very much. Um, I recorded some vocals for the first Dead Space that were used in the game a little bit, but other than that, I hadn't really done too much with it. But I remember, I was working on Tomb Raider, and I was trying to find a gong swipe, but I wanted it to be a very specific length and sort of with an accent at the end, so it would sort of roll into the next measure and sound a little spooky. And I'm in whatever the usual suspects were in 2010 or 2012, listening to all the gong swipes, and they all sounded great, but none of them did what I wanted. I mean, I probably spent 20 or 30 minutes trying to find this gong swipe. It was a little ridiculous. And I thought, I have a gong packed up, um, maybe I could just record it. I really had never done any recording on my own other than like the occasional vocal. Uh, if I was recording, I was at a studio, even a small studio doing drums or like guitars or something. Someone else was helping me with the recordings. I thought, well, you point the microphone at the thing you want to record. So I pointed the microphone at it, I put on some headphones, I listened, I plugged into my little mic preamp and I went and played it back and even dry with, you know, probably not the best space for recording uh, in terms of placement and all that, it sounded 10,000 times better than any of those gong samples that I had heard. Put a little bit of reverb on it and that was the beginning of my addiction to recording live things. I started buying more microphones, started buying more mic preamps. I was in a beautiful soundproof studio, so there wasn't a concern about, well, the mic's too sensitive and the truck went by or anything like that. Started recording my drums, started recording lots of percussion. That's when I started buying string instruments off of Amazon. I think I bought my bass first, then I got a cello, and then I got a viola and a violin, um, and just experimenting with those. Being a drummer, I can play anything and get a rhythm out of it. I can probably play anything and get a texture out of it too. It might not be the most pleasing texture, but with this whole Tomb Raider Dead Space kind of dark textural slant that my career seemed to be going down, I figured well, why not indulge it and just have some more fun doing some sounds on my own. Um, my next sort of epiphany was when I was working on um, a game called Evolve and I decided I wanted to do it all kind of through like guitar amps and things to give it an interesting sound. So even if I was playing some cymbals that would just go ding, 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 ding through the guitar amp, it was going <laughs> And I had my pedals set up on the desk, uh, just kind of like I do now, and I had my headphones on and I was going to play the gong actually. And I rolled over to the gong, but the microphone was hot and it was going through this chain of guitar pedals with reverbs and delays and choruses. And instead of just the usual kind of sound, it did all these like and it had like pitch shifters on it and stuff. And I just kind of stopped and listened. I was like, okay, I'm not recording gong right now. I went back to the beginning of the queue, hit record and just sat there and grabbed the desk and swung my chair back and forth. Like that was the effect that that particular song ended up getting. And I started realizing kind of the, the beauty of found sounds and especially when you're talking about textures and it doesn't need to be pretty. You're not trying to write a beautiful melody with the chair rolling across the ground. You're trying to do something that evokes a certain kind of mood. And from there, it just sort of blossomed. All of this kind of started and I didn't realize it back in 2006 when I was first working on the original Dead Space game. And I've gone through this in just painful details on my YouTube channel. The amount of music we needed and the interactivity that the game required, we, we couldn't record a live orchestra. Just, okay, cue number one, five minutes long and go. It needed to be 
a MIDI based score because of the control that we needed. But especially in 2006, there just was a very small amount of effects with orchestra that you could get via MIDI. And I wanted that, I'm the one that wanted to have the orchestra effects. EA basically said, we just want you to write the scariest music we've ever heard. We don't care if it's industrial guitar or if it's ambient something or orchestra. But for me, it was like orchestra. The orchestra needs to be a necromorph. You need to take the orchestra and just completely mess it up, but it's still natural. It's not going through effects processes and distortions and weird kind of signal things. It's just the way they're playing it is what makes it really crazy. And I had to sample it. It was the only way to start and I had no idea how to do it and had no idea how to plan it and it was basically just a trial by fire. The smart thing I did was I did three recording sessions instead of just one. So if I completely fell on my face and messed up the first one, I could learn from my, my mistakes and I'd have two more left. That was Dead Space 1 and Dead Space 2. I think I had six sessions total. And I began sampling the orchestra for EA, doing textures and effects and things, but also sampling the orchestra for myself. So I'd have an extra day of recording after two days at Skywalker. The third day would be, say, French horns. And I'd just be doing French horn samples. Effects and things like more granular control over the horns than I would for EA. Um, like I sample them in pairs, for example. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if I have them doing effects, they're actually, they're all doing the effect, but I have them times three. So they're playing really differently. It's just that sort of a thing. I didn't need that for Dead Space, but I wanted it for myself. So Tomb Raider, like I mentioned, first score that came out of my studio, and that was the first score that also had 100% my sampled orchestra. So I did regular notes and phrases and you know kinds of articulations as well, not just effects. And um, the interesting thing behind that is originally, I think we had a budget for 45 minutes of music for cinematics for live orchestra for Tomb Raider. And then you know, it's two hours or whatever it was, um, in-game music that was gonna be MIDI based. And I've only done that once and it was just like, just like everyone's normal sort of meme reaction to the cinematic versus the in-game, like real in-game footage. I didn't want the music to sound that way. And I said to the audio director, look, call me crazy, but just give me the whole budget for the, the live orchestra budget. Let's add more minutes. So I think we ended up having three and a half hours of music and I'll use my MIDI orchestra that I've, that I've sampled myself. And I still have people asking, um, so where'd you record that? Or I had horn players. There's a lot of French horn solos in it. And I even recorded like a, breath during the horn solos because the whole orchestra is on the stage in theory right um and the horn player is playing by himself it's literally just a horn so i recorded the breaths and i had three or four professors from colleges i'm the professor of blah 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 at eastman school and i just wanted to congratulate you on the tomb raider score and i thought the horn solos were just amazing if you wouldn't mind me telling you who the player was <laughs> i was using a breath controller and it was a like a a midi horn and and i I did the breaths. I literally listened to it with headphones and would go and <laughs> do a little breath in between. But I think it's important to have the MIDI, even if it's MIDI, be as real as possible, if that's what you're trying to do. If you're trying to make it sound like a horn, just kind of go, go all the way. So that's the way I've been with all of my instrumentation. Um, if I'm doing MIDI orchestra for textures or whatever, I'm still thinking, how would the players do it? Um, I just, I kind of picture myself on the stage with the orchestra in front of me and I hear them doing certain things from a certain perspective, certain phrases, the winds need to breathe, the brass can't play all the time. It's a very kind of old school classical way, but those are all the scores that I studied anyway. You know, all that b ballet suites and, and the planets and, um, the Firebird and all those amazing sort of groundbreaking scores back in the day. Like you can't really improve on that in terms of orchestration or melody or anything. So for me, that's, that's always going to be my go-to. It's funny because this, this one instrument called Circle Bells comes to mind. And I remember when it first came out, I bought it and I was using it 
all over the place. I think I was doing some um, fantasy uh, Heroes of Might and Magic, this Ubisoft fantasy game, and just the little bling, 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 bling kind of crystally sort of just pureness of the bells really, really worked. And I used it in a bunch of other things. But then like anything else, some time went by. I'd used it, didn't want to use it that much. And then I worked on this game called um, Little Hope for Supermassive, which is part of the Dark Pictures anthology. And I needed like church bells. Well, I wanted church bells, but I didn't want them to sound like church bells. I wanted them to be scarier than church bells. And what I ended up doing was taking the circle bells, and I don't know if it was like this in contact or if I just extended the range, but playing them down low, like really low, like multiple octaves down with a really long reverb, you get sort of this like, like, almost bell gong sort of thing. And that actually ended up being a big part of the, the ambient experience in Little Hope was that sort of bell sound. It's like if I didn't have some form of that in a stem for a cue that I would send, uh, the developer would be like, can we get one of those cool like bell from hell stems too? I'm like, absolutely, let's pull it back up and, and there we go. <laughs> Um, what kind of music do you want to write for a, a kind of fantasy adventure, mystical, magical thing that takes place in like the forest and old rundown castles? And it was just um, a natural extension of the way they created the game. That perspective I was mentioning where the mouse is so small. I like the idea of maybe as you're exploring the village, there's a pub, which I think there is a pub in the village, but there's a little mouse band in the pub and they're playing what? They're probably playing some pub kinds of instruments, you know, maybe like a hecklephone or a clarinet or something, a flute, a uh, little harp, like some little hand drums and a, some kind of tiny guitar. So I thought, well, what can I do that puts music on that kind of a scale? Anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's really tiny, but it just sounds small. It sounds not overly heavy, not overly epic, not what a lot of music, especially back then, but even today was being done, that just over the top super production style. So I decided to do lots of small solo instruments, as many as I could possibly play, literally just walking around the studio. Uh, Celtic harp, fits in my lap, check. Uh, ukulele, fits in my lap, check. Um, I'm gonna do percussion, whatever is hand percussion. I'm gonna just use that stuff. Some flutes, you know, just lots of really small instruments. And that's how the score came about, sort of in terms of instrumentation. And then having those kind of instruments to write with, when you're doing combat music, oh, let's go to the big drums, let's go to the big brass and the big chuggy strings. Well, none of that was in the score. So I had to rethink the way combat music would work. And I didn't want it to sound, even if we were using big instruments, I didn't want it to sound like that because it's just not that kind of game. Quill's almost dancing. She's got these amazing moves and she's got this little sword and she does all these jumps and I like the idea of sort of scoring it like a dance. So a lot of the combat music is almost like a waltz and it's very sort of bouncy and fun and even some of it's in a major key and I don't think I'd ever written any video game music besides like maybe a fantasy thing with like crazy chords that was in a major key, especially for combat music. So that was sort of like a, a feather in my cap. Um, just for me, personally, to be able to write combat music in a major key. Moss is this beautiful VR game. And it's the kind of thing that really only exists in VR because the, the way they made the game is unlike any VR game I've played before. You, you literally are sitting in what looks like a diorama and there's this mouse named Quill who, during most parts of the game, is actually mouse-sized compared to you. So just picture yourself uh, wearing VR goggles and you look down and there's this little tiny mouse village that is literally the size that a mouse village would be if it were really in front of you. So she's this tall and you can move closer, you can look up and see the trees, you can look behind you and see the brook. It's an amazingly immersive VR space and it sounds equally great. The funniest thing about Moss was the audio director for the original Moss four years ago, five years ago, called my agent 
just sort of looking for general composer submissions. You know, it's a storybook kind of game. It takes place in a forest. It's got all these little animals. Now, I've been with my agent for, back then I think it was 10 years. So she knew sort of what I love, which part of that is animals, and also what kind of music I would love to write, which is actually very much in line with the music that I wrote for Moss. But it's very contrary to the kind of music that most people associate me with. I think they hear graves and they think, you know, Dead Space or Until Dawn. Horror games, which is totally great. I love doing horror games. It's, it's really, really fun. But no one wants to do the same kind of game all the time, and I never really looked to do horror games. So the audio director calls my agent, general submission from Moss. She says, I know exactly who you need. Oh, he'll, he'll be happy to do a demo and everything. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. His name's Jason Graves. And Steven, the audio director, sort of laughed and said, um, I'm sure Jason's an amazing composer, but it's not that kind of game. Right? <laughs> right? That's just, I think... Um, especially with Tomb Raider, tombs and death and darkness, and they picture, you know, someone with like black leather and, and uh, piercings and lots of like tattoos and angry all the time. I only compose at night, you know, that, that sort of a thing. Fortunately, I was able to do a demo, which was just like a five or six minute suite based on some of the character designs, but they were showing me like a squirrel with a little saddle on it that the mouse would ride and it was just all these animal things and it's not just me my whole family we all love animals and i was showing it to the family i've got two girls showing it to my wife and everyone was just going oh, you've got to do this it'd be so amazing did the demo polyark loved the demo brought me on board and it was one of the most musically rewarding experiences that first moss that i'd ever had because it was literally the sky's the limit <laughs> 